Hi, I'm Ian Delisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. And this is Essential Cooking. In episode two, we talk about bees with biodynamic beekeeper Brad Gladstone of Urban Bee LLC. We learned that they can recognize faces, how they keep their hives warm in the dead of winter, and how dependent our food supply is on the survival of these wondrous creatures. Is it true that every like third mouthful of food we take is dependent on the bee? Honeybee. A honeybee. I yeah. Know. About 90% of all the food that we eat is dependent on a pollinator. So that could be a honeybee, it could be a native bee, it could be a wasp, ant, beetle, hummingbird. Anything that touches a flower and can pass along that pollen and nectar, that's a pollinator. And we rely, 90% of our food supply relies on that. There's like 20,000 species of bees around the world. Are they endangered in certain parts of the world more than other? How are we doing in the United States? How do we stack up um, when it comes to countries and protecting the bee population? How are we doing with that? Yeah, there's about uh, 20,000 bees worldwide, 4,000 native to North America. And it's usually seen in the more developed areas uh, where we see more of the um, peril and plight of the honeybee and all native bees and all of our pollinators. Just because of the habitat loss that occurs when you have urbanized developed areas, um, people are using more pesticides in those areas to keep their yards clean. You know, there's just more commerce, more cement jungles, as they're called, concrete jungles, and not a lot of forage for those pollinators to feed off of. But you mentioned, because Mabel Gray has one on the roof, that they have about a three mile radius that they can fly, right? Correct. So it's you don't want to scare people off from doing urban hives. Bees can certainly survive in those concrete jungles as long as that they have some kind of like you know network in that three mile radius. Correct. Beekeeping in southeastern Michigan, you know, it's it's really I think it's in its infancy. I think you can really you could take on a hundred more you know beehive customers today, and yeah. they'd have plenty to do. Oh, absolutely. It's not like we have, like, be cautious, there's too many bees to concrete ratio. <laughs> right. Like, we have a lot of pollinating to do. Yes. So, so we want more bees and more beehives in southeastern Michigan. Yes. And not just our honey beehives, but we also want to promote the health of the native bees as well. They're the true underdogs, those 4,000 species uh, that we have in North America. Honey bees are not actually native to North America. A lot of people are not aware that um, they came over with the European settlement. Therefore, they're in some ways considered, depending on what group you talk to, an invasive species because uh. they're so OCD and powerful in numbers uh, with their pollination that they sometimes can push the native bees to the sideline. So what's a native bee and how do I get a native beehive? Um, a native bee, the two most popular native bees that uh, we see uh, are the mason bee, the orchard mason bee, and the leaf cutter bee. And you can go to crownbees.com. They're probably the leader on um, native bees uh, for beehives, as well as actually purchasing the bees. And you can get them. They come delivered in spring, just like honeybees. And their hives are really easy to set up. It's essentially just like a little, it looks like a little birdhouse, uh, just with a bunch of tubes in it. And those tubes allow for the solitary bees to go in, lay their eggs, collect pollen. And they cap it off, which is why they're called mason bees. They cap it off with mud. And then the... Mm -hmm. Little baby bees grow inside that tube. But can we, can Ann and I, for instance, put a mason beehive on our property that has a honey beehive? Absolutely. So they can, they can, they can coexist. Yes. And how many mason bees will be in a mason beehive? Because, you know, honey bees, you got like 50, 70,000 in there. Yeah. It really depends on the hive size. Um, each tube is about six inches long and you can get about four to six babies in there. So, if you have a couple tubes and you're only going to have, you know, 10 to 20 bees that emerge in the following spring. Got it. But if you have, you know, hundreds of tubes, you could have hundreds of mason bees emerging in the following spring. But te so typically there's a smaller, you know, number in, in size. Yes. Even in the wild. Yes. Okay. Can these bees visit each other's homes and everybody gets along or? That sounds dangerous. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, it's it sounds like dangerous. <laughs> and Are we talking native or honeybee? If a mason bee knocks on yeah. the door of a honeybee, what happens? Oh, they'll get crushed. <laughs> <laughs> they'll get crushed. Oh, you know what we should talk about for a second here is, so when the murder bees uh -huh. came murder to- Murder hornets. The, murder hornets came to the West Coast. I can't tell you how many people texted me about it. Yeah. And I, so I was like, and I, I wrote to Brad and I said, uh, am I supposed to be concerned about this? So what what is can you talk a little bit about that whole thing? Should we care 
are they going to take care of it out on the West Coast and we won't have to deal with it here? <laughs> and what it, and what is this whole murder hornet thing? Right. So it's just uh, a species of hornet over in Asia. It must have come over here like on a boat or something. I can't imagine somebody would deliberately like say, oh, you look fun. Let's bring you over to the United States. So they must have gotten here uh, just by hanging out on a boat or something. But for the most part, they're not really something to worry about at the moment. Um, They are taking care of it over on the west side. Um, Entomologists are looking at it very closely. They took out the one hive that they did find. Usually any sort of threat like that is pretty much taken care of by nature. You're going to only see those murder hornets in the areas that are pretty similar to Japan, um, China, where they're coming from, um, which is the more like muggy sort of areas, which is why Seattle was perfect for them. They definitely like the warmer weather. And so Michigan, at least, is less attractive to them. But beekeepers are more than capable, conventional or biodynamic, of um, managing that kind of threat. And until we see colonies pop up all over the place, it's not really something to worry about. Honestly, think about it. If one of those bees came to a Detroit beehive, would never stand a chance. Like you're going <laughs> right. to come to Detroit, right. Mr. Murder Hornet, you'll never survive it here. Yeah. Um, to that point, you know, uh, when Brad put up my, um, you know, my beehive and we got started and everything, and he said, you know, the only thing you have to be worried about is maybe a wasp will try to get in there and get going, but that there are guards inside the entrance to the beehive and yes. they will take care of it. Yes. And toss them out. They're like bouncers at the yes. <laughs> at the entrance to the beehive, right? Yeah. I was just telling uh, James the other weekend that, uh, you know, I've watched many bumblebees and hornets try and go into a hive. And at first you get kind of nervous because they just prance right in like they own the place and they're in there for a good minute. And you're like, oh, my God, what are they doing? What kind of havoc are they wrecking in there? And the next thing you know, you just see like this linebacker football tackle of <laughs> six or 10 bees on top of this bumblebee and just go straight out the entrance. So they're very capable of handling their hive. And a lot of the guards you can't even see because they're actually sitting within the entrance. Um, So it's kind of like a stealth move, really. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been watching my hive. I mean, I, I, you know, at first you kind of watch from a distance, but at this point, I mean, I, I like crouch down and look like eye level with the bees. I mean, they're, they're, people are so unnecessarily nervous about honeybees. I mean, they're really, mm. they don't want to attack. You know, a honeybee will, like you said, Brad, it will die after it stings you. So that's obviously yes. one deterrent is they don't want to die. They have work to do. Right. But also, you know, you aren't a threat necessarily. If, if you're there every day and like, you know, I'm more cautious if I'm mowing the lawn, I try to get out of there. You know, it's the sound and vibrations are a little intense. Yes. I, but I, I respect their space. I give them a little pot of water next to their hive and I just kind of generally check them out every day and, you know, I feel like I have a great relationship with my bees and I can get eye level with them and watch them going in and out, watching the pollen come in and they won't even land on me. Yeah. You know, forget about being stung. They'll, they'll fly around my big head, yeah. you know, looking right at their entrance. Yeah. And I've, I've come to just, I mean, I, I always wanted honeybees and obviously yeah, that's why I have them, but I absolutely adore them now. Yeah. Like I, you, you don't just softly keep bees. You become like incredibly fascinated with it. Yep. You know, I'll say that um, during this whole COVID you know, this year of COVID, it has been visiting the bees when I'm working at home all day and I go Mm -hmm. out and I visit and see how they're doing. And, you know, they really don't care about me. They have such, they have such specific jobs to do and they are so laser focused on what they have to do. They really don't care. They can recognize people's faces, right? Correct. Yes. Which is why I recommend all of my clients to go out and say hello to the bees on a regular basis because then they'll become more friendly with you over time, even though they're already very docile. I do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> I have coffee and I say hi to the bees. Yeah. When we first got our hive, I said, maybe we should put pictures of ourselves right outside <laughs> right. the hive. So they're like, these are the Like people. family portraits. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So Brad, what is the difference between biodynamic beekeeping, which is what you do, and commercial beekeeping? And how do the, how are those bees treated differently? I mean, it's got to be, the, the goal is different, right? Absolutely. So the biggest difference between biodynamic beekeeping and conventional beekeeping really is at a high level, the focus. Biodynamic beekeeping is bee centric, whereas conventional commercial beekeeping is beekeeper centric. So biodynamics focuses on propping up the natural vitality of the bees, whereas commercial beekeepers usually have an interest in selling honey. 
So their uh, management is going to be more focused on how do I get more honey production, um, which is not necessarily in the bee's best interest. Biodynamics really flips it 180 to a more naturalistic approach and allows the bees to produce their own honey in natural comb. Um, they don't use plastic foundation. They allow for the bees to swarm, which is a major difference between the two. Um, swarming is very healthy for bee colonies. Um, it reduces mite counts in the hive if you do have any mite counts. And um, it's a natural reproductive system of the beehive. Most people don't realize that um, that is the reproductive cycle of the bee colony, not the queen. The queen just supports the current colony, but the way you get two colonies is by allowing a colony to swarm. So really the biodynamic focus is making sure that the bees are able to handle um, their environment on their own naturally in the best way possible. It allows for adaptation versus commercial beekeepers where their bees are usually more dependent on the beekeeper. I always like to say that if you had a biodynamic hive next to a commercially managed hive and you were to walk away from both hives for 10 years and not touching them, then the biodynamic hive would have a much better chance of surviving over the commercially managed hive because their natural vitality is up, um, their natural instincts are promoted, and um, they're able to thrive on their own. Whereas the conventionally managed hive uh, was very dependent on the beekeeper and it's gonna need that support. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. Are you connecting the dots between colony collapse and conventional beekeeping? Yes. The school of thought that I subscribe to is biodynamics, but the teacher, the leader in the industry is a company called Spike Nard Farm. They're in Virginia, and they're a complete biodynamic farm, honeybee sanctuary. Um, and that's their title, but they're really a sanctuary for all living beings uh, that exist in nature. They have really pointed out that uh, conventional beekeeping is one of the major players in colony collapse disorder just because of that sole purpose that the bees are focused. They're dependent on the beekeeper as opposed to um, being able to thrive naturally. The survival of the bees, you know, we've, we now all know is, is so critical. How can people help the bee if they just want to be able to do good things in their own way to contribute to the survival of bees and to keep them healthy? Yeah, so there's a guy out in California named Ron Finley, and um, his slogan is plant some shit. And that's pretty much the number one thing you could do to help any sort of native pollinator out there. Even if you only have one pot, like just grow something. Provide that forage for your native bees and your native pollinators. Uh, if you don't have a pot, like just get creative. Use a cup, use an old hat you don't wear anymore, throw <laughs> some dirt in there. I mean, if you, if you look up his project, he literally uses anything. He'll find a sink on the side of the road and pick it up and throw some dirt in there and grow out of it. And really that's the number one thing that we can do to help support our pollinators is by giving them that forage. Uh, because like we were talking about before, uh, in a concrete jungle, you take out that food supply and you can't survive if you don't have food. Flowering plants specifically, yeah, you would agree? That's Absolutely. Odd, I mean, One of the easiest ways most people can grow a flowering plant is just allowing their yard to act naturally. A lot of us have clover and dandelion growing in our yards, but we cut it or we spray it with herbicides to kill it off. So just allowing your lawn to grow naturally and flower is a big, big step in the right direction. Bee balm uh, is great for the pollinators. Anything like borage, mountain mint, milkweed also helps out the monarch butterflies, which are in decline as well. Any herb really is amazing for the bees. They love herbs. Um, sage, thyme, the mint family, lavender, all of that is great. Obviously, um, they need water too, so leave out some water for them, either in the form of a bird bath, a little dish with rocks in it. Make sure you have something for the bees to land on safely so that they can um, collect that water for their colony. So what do they do? They, they get the water and they take it back, and then what happens? They will store it in the hive or use it to cool off the hive if it's a really hot day. But they'll use that water um, to consume, obviously, but if they're storing it in the hive, they'll use that, uh, mixing it with the pollen to make bee bread for the young. 
um, or like I said, fanning off the hive and cooling it off. So speaking to that point, Brad, talk about how the climate control mechanism the bees use to keep the climate mm-hmm. either warm in the winter or cool enough in the summer. I always like to really describe that process as more of a temperature regulation instead of like a heating and cooling system Um, because the bees need the hive to be 95 degrees internally to um, rear babies. Even in the dead of winter, even if it's going to be, you know, a polar vortex, negative 40 degrees, uh, if it's February or March and the queen starts laying eggs, they need it to be 95 degrees. So that's where the magic happens, really. If it's going to be too hot, they need to cool it down, bring it back down to equilibrium. If it's too cool in there, then they're going to generate heat. Um, What they'll ultimately do is they'll collect that water. And like an attic fan, really, they'll just push air into the hive, which sucks out the hot air out of the hive, just like an attic fan. And they'll will regulate the temperature and cool it down. And if they really need to expedite that process, they'll use those water droplets almost in like um, one of those misting fans you'll see at the roller coaster parks, you know, when you're standing in line and they'll just spray some water mist and pump that into the hive and help cool it off. So they can dislocate their wings, right? Yes. In the winter, they cluster in the cells of the honeycomb and they will just vibrate their wings violently. It's kind of like throwing your car in neutral and revving the engine. It's warming up the car, um, but it's not going anywhere. So it's creating that friction and uh, generating that heat to keep it between 65 and 95 degrees all winter long. Now, I think it's important to mention, so when you talk about beekeeping in a biodynamic way, what that means for the, the, you know, the, who, the home or the person who's paying you to come keep bees, you're not going to get that golden honey in the middle of summer in a, in, you know, in a frame handed to you. Bee keeping in a biodynamic fashion means that you're going to hopefully have some honey in the spring left over from the winter that the bees didn't consume. And that is when you extract honey for the, you know, consumer and then let Mm -hmm. them build more for the following winter. So I think it's important. That's a big difference. I think when people think about, Oh, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a beehive. I'm going to get honey. I do buy from some conventional beekeepers and I just bought 20 frames last week. So this is the time when I harvest very fresh, beautiful honey from them. Right. But obviously in this method you're talking about, it's less honey, maybe a little more nuanced because it's aged. Essentially it's sitting in the, in the hive over the winter. In fact, the one on top of Mabel was fermented because a little bit of moisture got into the honey and Mm -hmm. when water is introduced into honey, it ferments. Yes. And that's also how we get mead, which is the most ancient beverage on the planet. It's also delicious by the way. Fermented honey is incredible. Do not overlook it. Yes. But it was a darker, nuanced, you know, delicious honey mm-hmm. that we got at Mabel Gray, but it's not that golden, you know, traditional honey that clover or wildflower honey are used to seeing. Correct. And even in the spring, uh, depending on the health of the colony, uh, biodynamic still, they never let go of that bee-centric ideology um, because if the colony is struggling or if, for example, it's supposed to be a really wet spring and they have frames of honey left in the hive, the beekeeper might say, okay, well, it's going to be a wet spring. You're not going to have a lot of forage. We could harvest this honey, but then you're not going to have any food for the next three weeks. So even then, we look at the bees' health and we say, what do you need to get you to the spring and on your own? And anything in excess over that is what is harvested. So do you think that humans on planet Earth consume too much honey then? Because in theory, beekeeping in a conventional way is how we produce honey. But if everyone was biodynamic... The world mm-hmm. over, you know, countries like Belgium, where you see a lot of honey production. So you're also arguing for a, a shift, less consume. But I'm sure you probably want us to eat less sugar in general, but less honey as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question because I don't necessarily think people consume too much honey, but it's uh, too highly sought over in the market and it's too overproduced, so if you, you will. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that the stockpiles are so ridiculously high. We consume what we produce yeah. in theory. So you want us to make less honey or, or increase biodynamic production so much that our, the, the demand is met in a more sustainable way. So that's exactly. essentially your argument. Yes. So if somebody out there feels attacked right now, what Brad's saying is we want more bees. We don't want less honey. We want more yes. bees. Support okay. our pollinators, more production in that, kit, in that sense, naturally. And I also think it's worthy of noting that it's really taking um, you know, living to a more simplistic level where uh, a lot of people that I look up to, like Henry David Thoreau, Walden, they promote this idea of, you know, eating 
the food and drinking the drink of the season. Uh, so if we were to just focus on what's growing in season and consuming that, we would really only be consuming honey in the spring as yeah. opposed to all year long. We would appreciate it more in that sense as well. I think we can all agree with that. We have a couple of fun questions for you. All right. That are food questions. What food is always in your refrigerator? Oh. Um, I'd say honey. <laughs> I know, yeah, caught me on that one. <laughs> Eggs. And if you go to a fast food restaurant, what one is your preference? Like if you're stuck, you know, maybe you don't eat a lot of fast food, maybe you do. I like don't. You're on the road. If you had to. And you have to. You pull over at Birch Run. There's every fast food restaurant in the world. Which one are you pulling into? Probably Panera. You can go stay pretty healthy with Panera. That's like a, That's a good kind one. of an answer. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> Culver's. What's your, what's your favorite? Yeah, How about that? Culver's? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that Chicken sandwich. That's a, all right, there you go. <laughs> all right. And what, who's your favorite music artist? I would say Chase Atlantic. So that was episode two of Essential Cooking. And we would like to thank LaMarca Prosecco for their support. Fresh from the hills of Veneto, Italy, you can never go wrong with the little Prosecco. Our executive producer is Joan Isabella. Associate producers are Lisa Brancato and David Lyons. Production provided by Studios on the Pond and Rowan Nemisto. Original music provided by the Mallet Brothers. This is a production of Detroit Public Radio Station WDET. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and join us as we explore the world of food and how to cook it right here on Essential Cooking.